Hello friends and foes of Middle-earth and welcome back once again. In this last episode we will break down the Rings of Power trailer shown at the San Diego Comic Con. And then at last, end with the conclusion. What is my final verdict for the Rings of Power? How long accurate is it? And maybe you now know a lot more about Tolkien and the show. So let's jump right into it and break down the trailer. The first thing we see is Galadriel, laying this elven helmet next to a whole pile of them. At first glance, this might seem like a reference to Hauth and Nirnaith, the hill of the slain. But if that's the case, it's wrong in so many ways. First, Galadriel did not fight in the Battle of Unnumbered Tears. Secondly, the battle was won by the forces of Morgoth, so she likely wouldn't be safe to walk around in that area, all alone, right next to Angband. Thirdly, the hill was not made out of helmets, but bodies of the slain. And fourth, the hill was made by the orcs and not by the surviving elves, men or dwarves. So if this is some vague reference, it's off by a long shot. I have a strong feeling that it is. So I'll give it a double negative. One for the whole setting being wrong, and one for Galatriel's forced involvement in the battle. That did not happen. Oh, and before we move on, the voiceover says something about a war that had ended, so I'm pretty sure it's a reference to the First Age in some way, and not the events related to the War of the Last Alliance, that will likely first occur in Season 5, if this series ever make it that long. Smog Elrond in Linden. We have this scene again, that we also got an image of from the Empire magazine. Nothing new to add. Oh wow, children. I'm not even sure what this is supposed to be, but I guess it's not important. Again, same footage we've already seen twice by now. And Sadok Burroughs, with some terrible dialogue again. Are strange. I think the only good thing about these few seconds is that it made my friend laugh. I'm sure he's not the only Tolkien fan that sees this show more as a joke at this point. And not a very good joke, by the way. Arondia and Bronwyn again. For the first time we seem to have our Menelos. It does look like the article that said it was a coastal capital was indeed wrong. So, as promised, I'll remove one law inaccuracy point, but hang on. Is that the temple that was constructed in Amenelos? Well, that can't be. Because Sauron was actually responsible for its construction, as he corrupted King Arpharazon, who, by the way, is only an advisor in the beginning of the show. I guess it could be the Hall of the Kings and Queens of Numenor, but it does seem much closer to the temple we know from the law. So I'll add another law inaccuracy point right back. Oh, and I bet the Palantir we see in the next shot is inside this tower. Okay, so there's a bit of mistakes concerning the Palantir, or Palantiri in plural. Elendil's father, Amandil, was given seven Palantiri by the elves as comfort to the faithful. But there's a whole number of issues with the Palantir in this scene. First, Amandil doesn't seem to be in the show at all. So the way it would end up there would be very different. And secondly, the Palantiri was granted as the shadow fell upon Numenor. It doesn't seem like that has happened yet in the show. And thirdly, the Palantiri was given to the faithful, who by the way was not very active in Armenelos. So it wouldn't be there. And for those reasons, we'll give a double negative law score. And then another issue with the Palantir, which we see in this shot. It seems like it's used to look into the future or perhaps the past. Well, it was a tool for communication, though a person of great power could manipulate the stones to see virtually any part of the world. But could the Palantiri actually look through time? Well, the law does say so. If used correctly by a powerful individual, I would say Galadriel qualifies, so it gets a low point. And then we have Galadriel with her dead brother Finrod. The scars on his arm seems to be a neat reference to his death, so a low point for that. And for once, a hair color seems to be right. Seems a bit cheap to get a point for it, especially when it's short hair. So no points. I have to say though that this scene with Galadriel and the body of Finrod never happened. So another negative low point. In fact, Finrod was reincarnated shortly after, so it just makes this whole scene unnecessary. <laughs> You laugh, it's funny. <laughs> no, you agree? <laughs> and Nimloth, the white tree. This is the tree that Isildur stole a fruit from and planted in secret. 
The fruit grew into a seedling that Isildur brought with him to Middle-earth during the downfall of Numenor, and he later planted it in his city, Minas Ethil. I think it's good that it's in the show, but let's remember it's a white tree. You know, like the one we later see in The Lord of the Rings? Not the same tree, of course, but it should look similar in at least some ways. So I have to give a negative law score for the color, but also a low accuracy point for at least featuring the tree. And then we come to this. To me, it seems like the tree is dying and somehow foreshadowing the downfall of Numenor. It is true that in the lore, Muriel's father, Tarpalantir, prophesied that the downfall of Numenor would come when the tree would die. But it surely didn't happen like this. Instead, it was cut down at the instigation of Sauron, and its wood was used to light the first flames in the fire of the new religion, which worshipped Melkor, or as you might know him, Morgoth. I'll give a negative law score once again. Though I think it's pretty cool that they at least used the dying of the tree as foreshadowing. I feel it's a bit cheap to give a law score for it, but alright, let's do it. And either Sauron or Milko priests? Go oh, by Gandalf's beard. Emo Eminem? This is actually a woman. I bet you are surprised as well. Oh, and thankfully not Sauron as it was wrongfully confirmed to be at first. So this is not Sauron, just to make that clear. But again, a haircut that doesn't seem to fit in Middle-earth, not only in my eyes, but in the eyes of the majority of fans. A uh, personal negative. I feel there's enough evidence law-wise to support this idea of worshippers of Melkor, but I would have done it differently, and I think the whole thing is a bit too vague, so... Instead of giving a positive and a negative law score, I'll just give no points. That seems fair. The throne room of Durin the Third. Not at all impressive. Erebor in The Hobbit seems much more impressive in every way possible. Though I feel overall they fail to capture the grandeur of Khazad Doom. And it seems way less impressive than Erebor in The Hobbit, which it shouldn't. So I'll give a negative law score. I decided not to give the crown a personal negative last episode. But seeing it again, I have to give it one. Is this really the best and most beautiful crown that the dwarves could make? Nah, don't believe it. I don't believe it. it looks more like a crown that an orc would wear. Some burning village Galadriel is in. I'm pretty sure it's the same we saw on this shot long ago. And now this image from the last trailer seems way less likely to be Dago Baragolak. Could this be Tiharad, the village we have heard so much about? Well, it seems very likely to me. And this, Utumnum perhaps, the fortress of Morgoth? I think it's more likely that this will be Sauron's Isle, Tol in Gaurahoth, Isle of the Werewolves. I think it makes sense that it would be this location, due to Finrod being in the story. Does it make sense in a second aid show? No, not at all. But maybe it's a flashback, or something else? I won't give points though, it could be pretty much anywhere. The Eye of Sauron? I don't know. Seems likely. Maybe this is the symbol for Morgoth in the show, as it could resemble his crown. And this old evil guy, spreading the word of Sauron? There are some contradictions in Tolkien's lore about who would use the name Sauron, his enemies, or also his own servants. It's not too important. This character is most likely made of anyway. Bronwyn for a second. I bet she's hiding from some orcs. And this creep, whatever it is, I'm not a fan of it. It reminds me a lot of the creature from Pan's Labyrinth. I can recommend you to watch that film if you haven't though. And Theo with the broken sword. Many thought early on, including myself, that this was either Gurthang, Anglakel, or a Mogul blade. Based on the magic we see, it seems more likely to be a Mogul blade. Could this mean Theo will become an Nazgul? Let's hope not. Perhaps it will be another character in the show. Kemen wouldn't surprise me. It's all vague and guessing at this point, so I can't give any points. And the elves inside what I presume is the fortress we saw earlier. This makes me less hopeful for the scenes we have seen with the elves walking in the snow. Many have suspected that it would be the crossing of the hill Karakse. Instead now, it seems more likely that Galadriel will lead a bunch of elves into the far north and search for Sauron or other servants of Morgoth. It's all pure fanfiction, 
and then a ship exploding in a Numenorean harbor. I took a look at one of the previous images, and I'm fairly confident that this is the same location. Feel free to judge yourself. And Adar walking among some orcs with skull helmets. Why do they look like the hyenas from The Lion King? I have to give a personal negative. Halbrand in Numenor. Am I the only one that feels that the actor looks different each time we see him? Wow. That helmet doesn't fit at all. Bronwyn holding a speech. I wonder how you sigh in Sindarin. And the sword, likely held by Theo. It's also the sword Galadriel is holding a bunch of times. Both a Feanor reference. Again. Still too vague for me to give points for. Galadriel with the sword. Now on board a Numenorean ship. Albrand and Galadriel teaming up. What a surprise. Rondir trying to be cool. And Muriel with some sort of crown. This is also law inaccurate. So, another negative. Oh, and this also made my friend laugh, by the way. And the dwarf religion once again. I really fear the worst for this. It looks kind of ridiculous at this point, and so... I will do my best not to give a negative, but I'm so close. A bunch of stuff we have already seen that doesn't reveal anything new. Orcs. This orc also appears several times, and seems to be one of the orcs Arondir will fight against. And then we have this. A gigantic sea monster attacking the raft that Galadriel and Halbrand are on. As Tolkien wrote in The Adventures of Tom Bombadil, there are many monsters in the sea. We know from the Lost Road and other writings that there are sea serpents or fish dragons in the world of Arda, at least according to the elves. No story tells of their appearance in the history of Arda though. Still, this could very much be such a creature, but then again, do they even have the rights to use that stuff from the Lost Road and other writings? Something seems off here. Still, a low point for this. Numenor with female soldiers is probably one of the dumbest law inaccuracies in this show. During the fourth, nothing new to add. A half foot talking to the stranger. It doesn't look like Eleanor as I thought it would be. Let's just hope that the stranger is not meant to be a young Gandalf. That would be law breaking in so many ways that it's hard to fathom. Arondia going full Mary Poppins. I really dislike this sort of exaggerated combat. So, another personal negative. And the orc, a lot of fans of the show have been amazed by. Some people think it's Jet Brophy. Maybe, maybe not. It takes a bit more to impress me though. And the village we saw burning earlier. Seems even more likely now. Perhaps this was done by the Balrog we see at the end of the trailer. Or perhaps just some orcs. And Emidem blowing a leaf. Do I even have to share my thoughts here? I haven't heard anyone liking this actually. A personal negative. The voiceover we hear is apparently Sauron. I don't dislike it, but it's too little for a point. And Arondia likely captured by Ents or Entwives. I'm not that impressed by this though, so no points. And at last, the Balrog. I really hope this is not meant to be Durin's Bane, we know from the Lord of the Rings. That would be law breaking in so many ways. I fear it is though, but then again, maybe not. I think one thing is certain, and that is that we will see a Balrog fighting, though perhaps not in season 1. It's known that after the War of Wrath, some Balrogs escaped the destruction of Beleriand, and hid deep underground in places at the roots of the earth. The only one we encounter later on though, is Durin's Bane which was actually not known to be a Balrog at first when it appeared in Casa Doom. So unless they only use the Balrogs in flashbacks, they will be breaking the law. I find it very unlikely that they will only feature in flashbacks though. They'll give a negative law score. I'll give one personal positive, because it's a Balrog and we all love Balrogs, especially the ones without wings. And secondly, another personal positive to make it very similar to the one we know from the Lord of the Rings. It's just too bad they didn't do the same for the elves. The horns on the face looks different, so it gives me hope that this will not be during Spain, but another Balrog. And that was the Comic Con trailer. It's quite impressive that the only thing interesting in this trailer is the last three seconds. 
There were other footage shown at the Comic Con that has yet not been shared online. But let's look at this image at least. We see the trees of Valinor dying and the shape of Morgoth above it. Can't see Angoliant anywhere, he'll hold back with the law point. But it's a cool thing to include, and not something I would expect to see in a second age show. So, a personal positive at least. There were other images shared online, but Amazon have been busy removing them everywhere they can. So instead we'll move on to the conclusion of this mini-series. So overall, 97 personal points have been given. That's a negative rating of a little more than 69%. And 76 law points have been given. That's a negative rating of 75%. I think that's a lot of things to get wrong. You can really measure it like this, of course. The time compression alone turns this entire show into pure fanfiction. But, as Bilbo would say... If it's just a bit of fun. Oh, you're probably right, as usual. I don't have much hope for this show, honestly. I know many of you feel the same way, and there are also those that are super excited for this. It's okay to have a different opinion, of course, but there's absolutely nothing at this point that can convince me any longer that this will be a good series, based on Tolkien's works. When you deviate too much from the source material, it stops being Tolkien at some point. And I think the majority of people feel Amazon have crossed that line long ago. I have created these 8 episodes so people can get an overview of what Amazon gets wrong and right, and it should be clear that barely anything will be based on Tolkien's works. Will it be an interesting show though? Well, it looked rather generic to me, at least so far, and I feel the overuse of CGI and the poor costumes is something that drags down the show even further. But what do you think? Are you excited for this show? Leave a comment. Is there anything good about the Rings of Power though? I think the best thing about this show is the fact that it will draw new people into the works of Tolkien. I truly hope and believe that new people will pick up the books and read them for the first time. Perhaps some of these new fans will even find my channel and learn a thing or two about the amazing world of Middle Earth. As I revealed some time ago, I also plan to share with you all how I would write Season 1 for the Rings of Power. So I'll cover that in a video after Season 1 is over. And now, at long last, we've come to the end of this little series. Here at last, on the shores of the sea, comes the end of our fellowship. But fear not, my friends. I do have a couple more videos planned for the Rings of Power, which I'll cover before the show airs. So stick around for more. I did plan to buy the Gollum game and play it on the channel, but it's been delayed for now. So instead, I hope to cover some of the lore videos that have been postponed for weeks now. Thank you all so much for listening to me. I feel very blessed to have so many wonderful fans of the channel, and it has truly grown quite fast since it started in November. If you like what I do here, you can now also become a member of the channel, or donate with the super thanks function. Thank you all for watching. Feel free to check out one of these videos, and farewell till we meet again.